Hey y'all, welcome back to Biblically Blonde, and in this video we're going to go over Exodus 3. So if you want to know what happens, then keep watching. Alrighty y'all, like I said in the intro, this video is Exodus 3. I'm actually racing against the clock right now because the little one is taking her nap and I don't got a lot of time, so we're gonna try to get through this uh, before that baby wakes up. If you haven't already, go and check out what you need to know before you read Exodus and then chapters one and two. They will be linked below as well on my YouTube channel homepage. So be sure to check those out. I am creating an Exodus playlist and also go to Biblically Blonde on Instagram. I just created a brand new Instagram um, for Biblically Blonde where I can go over these Bible guides more in detail and talk more one-on-one -on -one with everyone so be sure to follow me there and let's get started into what happens so what happens in Exodus 3 well at the end of uh, Exodus 2 we actually get introduced to Moses we meet Moses as a baby and we hear the story that everyone knows which is where he's put into the Nile River and he's taken into Pharaoh's household we then hear a little bit more about how he actually murders a Egyptian who is beating a Hebrew slave, and then he runs off. And so Exodus 3 picks up where that kind of leaves off. And we learned that he marries a woman named Zipporah who is living in the land of Midian. Well, it's 40 years later. This is where Exodus 3 picks up 40 years later, and Moses has basically made a life for himself. He's married, he has two sons, he is a shepherd, so he basically has taken on his father-in-law's business. Um, he is a priest, but he's also a shepherd. The father-in-law, not Moses, but I guess technically Moses is full too. But um, So he basically has this whole life for 40 years that has been established for himself. And God has not really spoken to him since. Um, and that's all about to change. So what we have is we see that it tells us that Moses is tending to his flock and he sees a bush or a tree that is burning but is not consumed. And so this is kind of hard. It's always been hard for me to understand what they're saying here. But from what I can gather is this tree was clearly on fire, but it was not burning up, being completely consumed and basically, you know, withering away. Anything that catches on fire withers into ashes. Well, this tree was burning, but wasn't withering away. It was just consumed by the fire, but still present in its entirety as the tree. So that's kind of how I think about this. And so it's different than anything than we've ever thought of when it comes to fire, because fire typically burns up and destroys whatever it touches. So Moses sees this and he thinks, hmm, I should go closer and look at this, which is funny to me because like whenever I see things that are like out there are different, I'm like, no, we should walk away from that. But Moses is like, let me go check this out. So as he's getting closer, God actually speaks to him. He calls his name Moses, Moses, and Moses replies, here I am. But before he can get any closer, the Lord actually stops him and instructs him to take off his sandals. And so this kind of gives us an indication of that God is holy. So it's not necessarily because, you know, God is so much better than us, which he is, but it's about holiness and cleanliness, which is a huge thing when we get into the later chapters of Exodus and the book of Leviticus. Cleanliness is important, and so he must take off his shoes when he is in the presence presence of God because God is holy. He cannot be around things that are not cleanly or clean. So then God starts talking to Moses and he basically says, I have seen my people. I have seen what is happening to them. I have remembered my promise to Abraham and now is the time that we are going to act. So then Moses kind of is like, well, why are you talking to me about this? You know, who am I to do anything about this? And this is where God actually says, it is going to be you who will lead the people out of Egypt. And so then we have kind of a back and forth with Moses where he says, you know, what should I do? God tells him, you know, this is what is going to happen. And then Moses asks him, okay, when I go talk to the Hebrews, what should I, who should I say you are? And God says, I am the I am. So here we have God actually giving himself a name. And the reason for this is because so many gods at that time, especially the Egyptian gods, had names. We have to remember here that for 430 years, the Hebrews had been intermingling with the Egyptians. And so a lot of their religious religious practices, 
these Hebrews took on. And so they're going to expect a name for this God that Moses is going to come and say that he's representing. Well, the Lord, he meets us halfway. He's not going to give in and give himself a name like the the God of Osiris or something like that, you know, the, the Egyptian gods. But he is going to put something to his name. So he is the I am. He is. And we see uh, Jesus actually referred to himself as the I am as well. He is the, the existence. And that is what he is saying here. You let them know that I am everything. He then goes on and is going to define himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this is even more defining than the I am. The I am statement lets us know that God is everything in existence. But the statement of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's lets the elders of the Hebrews know, and just the Hebrew nation in general, it lets them know, oh yes, our ancestors. Now, how many of them are actually talking about their ancestors every day is probably very slim, but it, they all know who their ancestors are. They all know that they come from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so if Moses is going to call upon that name and say that God has called them, every single Hebrew and certainly every single elder Hebrew will know exactly what Moses is referring to. So then he basically tells Moses that the elders of Egypt will know what he is referring to. They will go with him to Pharaoh and ask Pharaoh to leave for three days into the wilderness so they may offer sacrifices to the Lord. Now, obviously, the Lord knows that this is not going to happen and that he's actually going to be freeing them completely. But we're starting off with just that three-day request. And so he's telling him, you need to go and you need to do this. Now, the last section here is verse 21, and I want to give it some attention. It says, And I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed towards this people, so that when you leave, you will not go empty-handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters, and so you will plunder the Egyptians. So this is the last couple of verses in this chapter, and we can easily overlook it or just be confused on what he's saying and move on to Exodus 4. But what is happening here is it's setting up kind of an Easter egg for what's going to happen later when they're living in the wilderness. So the Lord is saying, you will not go empty handed. When you leave, you will not go with the shirt, just the shirt on your backs and with barely anything. In fact, you're going to be leaving with silver and gold. So he is going to make it so they are so favorably disposed. That's the word he uses, but essentially he's going to make it so the Egyptians are giving the Hebrews things, giving them items when they leave so they can leave and leave with many things of importance. And this matters because when they're building the tabernacle, they are going to need these types of materials materials and God is going to make it so they have everything they need to build that tabernacle. So why does this happen? Why does Exodus 3 happen? Well, Exodus 3 is pivotal in the story. Everyone mostly has heard of the story of the burning bush, but why does it matter? It matters because it's setting this story up to start happening. So far, we have, you know, kind of the prequel. We're setting the story up, Exodus 1 and 2. This is what's been happening for 430 years. This is Moses. Well, now the story actually, we hit play. And God's acting right now, and he is going to get this started. And he gets it started by talking to Moses. He appears to Moses, and he instructs him. It is also the first time that we have God refer to himself as the I Am. So we can know who he is. He is the I Am. So why does this all happen? It happens to lead us further into the story of Exodus. It is a builder for the rest of this book. So what does this teach us about God? Well, what I like to think that this teaches us about God is that we each have a specific purpose. When we look at the story of Moses, we see that he was not likely to be the leader of the Hebrews. He was an Egyptian for all purposes sake. He grew up an Egyptian in Pharaoh's household. He wasn't respected by the Hebrews and he wasn't respected by the Egyptians, or at least certainly not anymore. But God had Moses planned out for this specific purpose, and he has you planned out for a specific purpose. God creates every single being. God is the maker of life. He decides life, and he creates life. And each person has a specific purpose to God's plan. God's plan for us is to lead us to Christ. 
the story of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is the story of God's love for us and how he redeemed us through Jesus Christ. So each person, me, you, Moses, every person in the Bible has a specific plan, specific purpose towards the plan. That's what we can learn about God through this chapter. So then finally, how can we apply? Well, we can wrap up this chapter by knowing that when it is time to act, that we act. Moses had spent 40 years living in Midian. He had created a wonderful life with his children and his wife and his wife's family, and I'm sure he enjoyed many, many years of it. And God didn't call him to act at that time. He just was able to enjoy this life. But now, at the set time, at the burning bush, God says, it is time to go. You need to act. And every one of us has times, more than once, maybe once, whatever it is, we all have our own story, right? Our own specific purpose towards the plan, like I just touched on. But when God tells us to act, we need to act. And so that is why we can, or that is how we can apply Exodus 3. We can act when we are called. We don't have to keep questioning God. Well, why me? Or when should I do this? No, God will let you know deep in your soul when it is time to do what he has called you to do. And when that time comes, act on it. Alrighty, y'all. This wasn't as in-depth as I normally do. I, once again, am racing through the clock to try to get this done because the baby is asleep. But I will be up in a few days with uh, Exodus 4 because we're going to get through all of Exodus this summer. So be on the lookout for that. And I hope that this helps you in understanding this chapter better. Exodus 3 is really well known because of the story of the burning bush. Um, but I love it because it sets us up for the rest of the story. We are press and play. This story is about to get really interesting. All right, y'all, be sure to follow, check out biblicallyblonde.com, follow me on Instagram, and like this video if you enjoy these Bible guides. All right, y'all, I'll see you next time. Bye.